Thank you. I'll hand over the tape. Thank you. Oh, one, one last thing. Sorry, Dave, who spoke earlier, has said that there's a list. He's put a list for people who want to know more about the Palestinian and UK social work network at the back of the room. If you want to stay involved and, and be kept in touch with that, please just put your email address on the list at the back. Okay. Do we need a, a, a microphone, or is that overkill, considering I'm a scout? <laughs> <laughs> <No. laughs> my, my wife's also a PhD student at Durham. They don't get out much, so some bad news to Conservatives won the last general election. <laughs> the, what I want to talk to you uh, about this afternoon is the need for us to essentially have a diversity in our understandings of conflict, our understandings of imperialism. I work at uh, Teesside University, which is about 40 minutes down the road, but really a whole world away from some of the nicer parts uh, of this part of the world. We are the poorest uh, town in the north. Uh, we are overall the poorest town in the UK, we also have the highest asylum-seeking and refugee population in the UK, one in 170, as opposed to lovely Cornwall, which has one in half a million. So it's important when we're looking at services to realise that within countries we have significant diversity. Uh, one of the issues we have to deal with in the north in terms of refugee and asylum-seeking services is the fact that many people are, under, are experiencing a secondary forced migration, that they've been part of natural, um, organic uh, groups from home countries in London, but now they've been forced to the northeast for a very simple reason, you can buy a house for £6,000 here, yeah, as opposed to a million pounds in London. And in terms of the private sector, some individuals here are making themselves very rich out of services they're providing uh, to the asylum-seeking uh, and refugee communities. So, I want to talk a little bit about some linked narratives. The first is communal conflict in Northern Ireland. Um, to give you a bit of biography, I was a child protection manager in Northern Ireland during the late 80s, early 90s, at a time where there was still significant communal conflict with about 3,000 deaths over the course of that uh, conflict. Um, and more recently, for about 16 years now, I've worked regularly for the United Nations as a consultant in Central Asia and Africa. Uh, and I'm going to focus on some uh, recent uh, work in Central Asia, that's the countries surrounding Afghanistan, essentially, to look at some of the theoretical complexities of working at the conflict end of the chain of events which can make people refugees, okay? Um, there's a third perspective which might be relatively unusual for this group in that I was a soldier before I was uh, a social worker. Um, and one of the things I'm going to propose is that it's important we take a complete or total view of the impact of war when we're developing social policy so we include both services to refugees and the necessity of properly funded veteran services, and also to include, to understand the dual identity many refugees and asylum seekers can have as former veterans, as well as um, people fleeing conflict. Okay. Um, I did have quite an interesting uh, uh, experience a couple of years ago. I was uh, having a drink in uh, a city called Tashkent, which is in Uzbekistan, with a friend of mine from the Ukraine, uh, Vladimir Kuzminsky, and we realised I'd been in the British Army at the same time he'd been a Ukrainian in the Soviet Army, but more or less opposite each other. And so, as young men, as middle-aged men, we were getting drunk, uh, as young men, we could have ended up very easily shooting uh, uh, each other. And that's kind of a strange realisation uh, when you come to it. And one of the things that's very important as social workers, especially if, if, if you come from a non, completely non-military background, to understand, and this is quite provocative, it's not that difficult to teach people to hate. It's really not that difficult to teach people uh, to kill. I can still remember being on a fire range and people saying, oh, well done, Murph, he's dead. You know, and you think, yeah, he'd be dead. And only ten years later you think, oh, yeah, he'd have been dead, wouldn't he? 
Um, and that's not necessarily a good thing. War is a common human experience. I looked up the number of wars there's been since 1990. Yeah, not since the Second World War. It's 33 pages worth of wars that have been, um, simply since 1990 alone, okay? If you look at the UK, many people don't realize how militarized a society we are. There are four million veterans in the UK, people who've served in the forces in one way or another. That number vastly expands when you look at people who've seen service in other EU countries, uh, in the US, in Russia, in the former Soviet Union. One of the mistakes we can make in Western Europe is thinking that our, the luck we've had in escaping large-scale military conflict the last few decades is the world's norm. It is not the world's norm. There's only 15% of the world's population lives in, lives in what's called complete democracies within the UN structures. Yeah? Almost half the world's population, and that includes the social workers in these countries, live in authoritarian regimes. And one of the things I want to try and introduce to you in the, in, the, uh, in the time I've got left is a little bit about what it's like to practice social work in a dictatorship. Because we need to understand both ends of the spectrum. The experience of social workers trying to help refugees and asylum seekers at this end of the process, but also what it's like to actually work in war zones, in authoritarian cultures, in author under authoritarian governments. Because some of the best social workers I've met in the 30 years I've been in social work have worked in dictatorships. Outstandingly brave people. And people, a lot of whom you'll simply never have heard of. First thing I want to say, colonialism and anti-colonial views. Often in the West, we um, associate it with Western imperialism. There are, just as there are many racisms, there are many imperialisms. In Central Asia, a place I've worked regularly for about a decade now, the main imperialism was Russian imperialism, an aggressive Soviet imperialism. Um, and during this era, they even had a Soviet version of what used to be called cowboy and Indian films. Yeah? Where the, the heroic Soviet commissar, that's him there, who actually also has a talking dog. It's a long story. They're very popular, these films. Uh, the dog would run up to him and say, woof, woof. And he'd say in Russian, what? Imperialists over the hell? Over the hill pan planning to ambush the innocent communist soldiers? Woof. So it was almost an exact copy of the John Wayne ridiculousness, but set in the context of Central Asia. Um, that, by the way, is his inevitable local sidekick. A tribesman who's understood that the victory of communism is inevitable usually ends up getting shot, just as a lot of John Wayne's assistants did. Now, the reason I'm showing you that is to say, we make a mistake when we think there's one type of imperialism. Ask a Tibetan and their main experience of, of imperialism is uh, Chinese imperialism. In this whole area of the world, and Uzbekistan, uh, the country I've mainly worked in, has a population of 30 million. Uh, mass killings, suppression of indigenous culture was a feature from 1920s onwards, with millions killed under the Stalinist regime. One of the things you see in Central Asia a lot, again, people don't realize, is gulags. People associate gulags with Siberia. The deserts of uh, Karakalpostan and other parts of the world are littered with Soviet-era gulags. So it's important when we're working as social workers to realize imperialism has taken different forms. Many people in the world have experienced imperialism, not always Western imperialism. So, apologies if I repeat anything you've heard before. I was, at, I was in Holland until this morning at another conference, so if I say anything you've heard before, I'll just throw something. In wars since 1945, typically we've got ratios of displaced to fatalities of 10 to 1. Yeah? So for every fatality a war creates, there are 10 refugees or internally displaced people. Um, a basic list of wars, as I've said in the participants since 1990, takes 33 pages. Relatively few people in the world live in a complete democracy, as the UN categorises it. Uh, the UN categorises 
um, uh, political systems on a gradient from full democracies to flawed democracies, that would be Hungary, for example, moving to hybrid regimes, which again is a direction Hungary is moving in, uh, to fully authoritarian regimes. Here's something that I think people don't always focus on. Social workers work under all those regimes, and they have to find mechanisms of practice which allows them to work with uh, people who are often directly politically oppressed effectively. And some of the most creative work uh, that we see is under this type of regime, but it's not written about. And I'll explain to you, it's quite an obvious reason why it's not. It's important in, under in, taking, in trying to promote an international social work as well, that works with, with war and conflict, to understand the impact of colonial legacies. This is what a very common Farsi saying in Central Asia, if you trip over a stone in the road, be sure an Englishman put it there. Because there's a big belief, culturally, that the English are very cunning. Yeah? It's also a bit of a belief that the Americans are rather stupid. Apologies. But that the English, <laughs> the English are cunning. And people will say to you as a social worker, are you cunning? There's not really a good answer to that. I say, I used to say, well, no, I'm not cunning. But I'd say that if I was cunning, wouldn't I? <laughs> so it's very important that we don't replicate imperialist patterns of thought of thinking of countries we work in as the exotic other, but to recognize that we ourselves are as exotic and other to different cultures as they may appear. I want to give you a second quote. Uh, in um, around 2010, uh, I edited a book with a colleague in Russian and local Uzbek languages about gender in Central Asia. Domestic violence is a very large problem in Central Asia, uh, together with alcohol abuse, AIDS, HIV. After this came out, uh, my colleague uh, Ludmilla Kim um, was visited by the secret police. They came to her house, very intimidating. Again, those of you that work in such countries know the secret police aren't very secret because they all wear black leather jackets. So it's kind of a look they have, and they, it, it's meant to intimidate people. They turned up at this social work academic's house or flat and said, why have you written a book about gender in, social, in Central Asia? You've insulted our people. We don't have gender in Central Asia. To which she explained, gender just means men and women. Oh, does it, they said, and went away again. <laughs> There's lots of concepts we take for granted in social work, in developed social work systems, which can be seen as very threatening in authoritarian regimes, and a real big necessity for what I call proper political translation, so that effective practice can be done in areas of uh, conflict and authoritarianism. <coughs> it's important to realize that the discussion about the sources, the political sources of conflict are not new. This is a recent quote from Chomsky. And in fact, uh, some people here might have seen the great film director Oliver Stone, who was here in Durham last week. And he said, most wars are caused by power elites in all countries because the interest of the power elite is not the same as the interest of people. Now that's a relatively recent uh, view from Chomsky. I think it's about 10 years old. The fact is he's not saying anything new. <laughs> Orwell said this during the Second World War. Actions are held to be good or bad, not on their own merits, but according to who does them. So there's no kind of outrage, torture, the use of hostages, forced labour, mass deportations, imprisonments, assassination, bombing, which does not change its moral colour when it's committed by our side. Yeah? So, Everything that we hear, everything our students hear about war and the causal factors behind any individual war are always filtered through a hostile media. And it's one reason that conflict needs to be an essential part of the social work curricula. Now, I'm going to whip through because I've got five minutes. <laughs> I'm just going to sum up 10 years' work five minutes. 
Um, it's important we realise, when looking at conflict, the realities for the social world. This charming gentleman is the, is the Chechen president. When a social worker recently talked about the issue of poverty in families in Chechnya, he physically pulled her onto national TV and gave her a dressing down, and that was lucky. You know, because he said, we don't have social problems. So even acknowledging a society has social problems can be a cause of considerable uh, political risk to people. Corruption is an essential <coughs> fact we need to understand in understanding co conflict and the causal factors behind conflict and war. The UK doesn't make it into the top ten, by the way. <laughs> okay. We've had communal conflict in Northern Ireland. I want to summarise a, a complicated situation by saying that when you work as a social worker in an area of conflict, you need to take on board a different model of social work. For example, you need to develop services which are accessible to all communities in the conflict. If it's physically dangerous for a person to get from point A to your office, you need to develop outlying offices. You need, actually, something that's very rarely written about in terms of Northern Ireland, you need a balanced uh, social work teams which reflect both sides or multiple sides in a conflict. In that case, we needed Catholic and Protestant social workers without ever anyone saying we had uh, essentially a sectarian basis for our hiring practices. That was the reality. People need to understand that social workers in war zones have enhanced personal security needs. <coughs> yeah. We need to recognise the use of social work by armed groups and government. I myself, as a child protection manager, had to deal with one of my staff who was essentially what people call a terrorist. Yeah? He was an intelligence officer for one of the paramilitary groups and we dealt with him by paying him off. Quite a lot of money, £100,000, which was a lot of money back in 1980, in order to retire early. There are so many complex political issues when you're working actively in a conflict zone that don't promote neat uh, answers. There are complexities of practice. And I'm just going to finish by saying what I think some of the theoretical advances which need to be made are. Firstly, there's the issue of needing to be seen as politically neutral. Secondly, we need to acknowledge, in order to do effective social work in areas of conflict, that there are non-governmental sources of authority. In the mainland UK, the source of authority is state law and the government. During the conflict in Northern Ireland, the source of authority was the government, if you're working in a middle class area, the Protestant paramilitaries, if you're working in a Protestant working class area, and the IRA, if you were working in a Catholic area and you asked permission of the relevant military commanders before you did a child protection investigation. So, we need to understand the fractured nature of political authority and practice authority in conflict areas. During my time there, we needed to close down children's centres. It made a lot of sense to close down five in one area, three in another, we weren't allowed to, because it would have been seen as favouring one. Uh, community, so we had to choose four and four. Evidence-based practice makes no sense in a communal area, in a, an area of communal violence, unless it's mediated through political intelligence. You need to understand the impact of social work decisions on communities in conflict. And to remember that some workers, social workers, are active participants in struggle. I'm going to say what I think are four areas to finish. We need, desperately, a more sophisticated typography of social work relationships with conflict, rather than to have a simplistic notion that as social workers we're the good guys, we're the good women, we go and help people, and to realise the political typography we need is more complicated. Firstly, we need to understand that <coughs> social work um, duties involved with direct consequential social work as a result of conflict including refugees' food distribution, refugee tracing, organising chaos, refugee camps establishing rule of law, and administrative rec records. These are characterised by relative immediacy. 
and social workers play a major role in this, but we need a different set of rules and practices when we look at indirect consequential um, factors following war and conflict. We need to understand how to work with trauma, veterans, child soldiers, long-term resettlement, and need to construct new narratives for people to make sense of their experiences. We need to understand that social work is sometimes participatory in conflict. Social work is involved in the control of food in terms of war fighting and as a war weapon. Social workers have had significant roles in gathering soft intelligence on communities, on producing propaganda and the production of war stories and images based on a particular competence point of view. And we need to recognise that in many cases social work experience split loyalties. Social workers can have a loyalty both to the profession, which is very strong, and to their colleagues, but equally to the community that they've arisen from. I'm suggesting that whilst Europe is beginning to recognise the complexity of dealing with major refugee shifts, that as social workers and social work academics, we're needing to move to a more sophisticated acknowledgement of the different modalities which social work has in relation to conflict and relation to war. And one of the first steps is to recognise that we're not necessarily saints, we're not necessarily innocent, but that social workers themselves can be part of the process of conflict as well as part of the process of healing. Thank you very much.